Um, our next speaker is uh, Tony Budden, who's going to be talking about hemp, the industrial uses, and he'll be introduced by Jules Stobbs. Thank you. One of the really unique sides of our legal challenge is our blatant regard for wanting to be stoned, the, wanting to be high in a recreational and a medicinal way. I am a cannabis user and when we go around the country talking about our use of the cannabis plant, we always say that we don't really care about the medicine and we don't want to make socks. Because we don't, really. We enjoy, the cannabis plant is a very important thing to us and the uses of hemp are very important to us. I personally think hemp should be grown all over South Africa, specifically as biofuel. That is my number one. Many years ago, Fields of Green for All put in a, um, uh, a Section 21 application with the Department of Health. One of our directors specifically put it in for Fields of Green for All, and somebody had donated a piece of land outside Broncos Sprite. And the weird thing about that piece of land was it actually had a license to have a petrol station on it. So, now... We went off to that place and we looked at this piece of land and there was our benefactor said, do what you want with it. But of course, the Department of Health and the MCC completely ignored us and has ignored everybody ever since. So one day, maybe my dream will come true that I will be able to grow my own petrol, but I'm not interested in socks. They itch. So we talked about um, pioneering, seven years of pioneering, seven years of transcending all the fear. We're babies at pioneering. Your next speaker is the pioneer. He's been at this for 15 years, banging his head against the wall sometimes, knocking on doors, traveling Southern Africa, traveling the world, and I can't think of a greater emissary for the cannabis plant. And I'd like to welcome to the stage, Mr. Tony Button. Thanks. Right. Good morning. I'm going to be speaking about the preclinical uses of cannabis. That is the uses that can stop you having to go to the clinic in the first place. Sorry. So, definition of hemp. A lot of people have a misunderstanding of what hemp actually refers to, and the best definition that I can give is a descriptive term for the non-psychoactive uses and varieties of the cannabis plant. So non-psychoactive uses are fiber, food, building materials, biomass, and then obviously the non-psychoactive varieties. But saying that, not all um, cannabis gives you THC, but also the cannabis that does give you THC still obviously produces fiber and F food in the way of seeds. So we have been limited through legislation in doing research on only the low THC varieties, but hopefully one day, one day soon, we'll be able to do research on the fiber that is in our local varieties as well, and the food preparations and all of that. So currently the hemp industry is, is re uh, regulated to 0.3% of THC. So the uses include fiber products, textiles, everything I'm wearing is a cannabis product, um, nutrition products, cosmetic, um, biomaterials, biocomposites, fuel, medicines, paper, and more. And yes, bottom uh, right there is a door panel from a BMW 7 Series, so if you do drive BMW, chances are you're already driving in a cannabis car. Hemporium, we started in 1996, and that's a long time ago, and the re reason we started was we believed that at that stage, because the government had already started research into industrial cannabis, that the law would soon change, and we would be able to grow here, so we thought, what can we do? We can provide an education to the market, and we started making products from imported materials, and basically got our fabric from China, and we got food from Canada, we eventually built in, uh, bought in building materials from France and Germany and 
all over the world, hoping that one day soon we'll be growing in the Eastern Cape or anywhere else in South Africa. And since then, we've been in the role of what I call perpetual imminence. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And it hasn't come. So we had to join forces with these lovely people, the Dacher couple, and challenge this law that says cannabis, the whole plant, any product thereof, is an undesirable dependence-producing substance, which means my jacket, my shirt, my socks, my underwear, yes. Um, everything I'm wearing is listed as an undesirable dependence-producing substance. And that's crazy. Yeah, I depend on it, for sure. I depend on it to keep me warm. I depend on it to not be standing here naked in front of all you guys. But I also desire it, and I know a lot of other people who desire it. So the key we have to do here is break this one word, undesirable. So Emporium, everything that, that we've done over the last 20 years is to showcase what this amazing plant can do. And we have clothing range, body care range, food range. Uh, we've built five houses, which I'll tell you about more. And just to sh keep showcasing and hoping that the government's going to wake up. But that hasn't happened. So let's start with nutrition. Um, nutrition, obviously, the hemp, hemp seed is seen all over the world. It's, you can buy it now in Dischem and spas and any health, health store, but technically, it's still illegal in our country, even though these guys are selling it. The law says it should be marked not for human consumption, not to be taken. So they still think it's a poison, and they still think that if you drink hemp seed oil, you will get high. And we were raided by the Department of Health um, Law Enforcement Division many years ago. They took our facial oil from us, saying, you can't sell this. People are going to put this ducker oil on their face, and they're going to get high. So the education that we've had to go through has been huge. You know, with the, the Department of Health, obviously, who finally do understand it, I think, and obviously with our customers and, and the market. So the hemp seed has the optimum ratio of omega fatty acids for the body. So it's omega uh, 6 to 3 in a ratio of 3 to 1. So this plant pre presents things in balance. And that's what life should be about, finding balance. You know, sometimes we want to go a bit far. Sometimes we want to be really calm. But finding the balance is what's going to help our whole system run properly. Protein, globulin ediston, which is, comes from the word edible. It's a very digestible protein, and it doesn't have, have tryptine inhibitors that soy has, so it's much more absorbent to your body, especially for vegans, vegetarians. Um, and then albumin, which is the same as egg protein. The leaves and flowers can be juiced and eaten too, and it's grown organically with ease. You do not need to have a lot of pesticides and herbicides and synthetic fertilizers to make it grow. So it usually comes in three main products, which are shelled seeds, oil, and protein powder. So there we see the ratios in comparison to a lot of the other products. Hemp, flax, sunflower, soybean, pumpkin, canola, olive. And it's the gamelanolenic uh, acid, which is the one that is help, helps to fight cancers, helps your immune system, uh, moderate, or moderates the immune system to run properly. And there you can see that balance of omega-6 to omega-3 in the optimum ratio of 3 to 1. In the, pro the protein of the seed, obviously in the, the nut of the seed itself, so that's a picture of the shelled seeds. So they take the shell off. It's a very delicious. It tastes somewhere like pine nut or, or sesame seeds. You can add it to smoothies. You can put it on granola. Um, you can make milk out of it as a dairy substitute. High fiber, it's got your omegas, vitamin E, phosphorus, magnesium, antioxidants, potassium, anti-inflammatory agents, uh, manganese, and it's pretty much a complete pro protein. A more digestible protein than soy, more digestible omegas than flax, and more digestible fiber than kale. So it really is a superfood, but still one that's regulated in this cannabis, the whole plant, any product thereof. Hemp and brain health. You know, the omega fatty acids are essential for your brain to absorb protein. You know, if you do not get omegas in your diet, you do not absorb protein, your brain uh, is stunted in growth. And one of the things that I looked at quite closely is obviously our market at the moment is the superfoods market. It's the people who are already eating really well. They're already having coconut oil and flax oil and all sorts of other good things. And it, you don't really see that much of a difference when you add hemp seed oil in. But where we're seeing an amazing difference is in feeding schemes in the townships. I'm going to tell you a bit more about that later, but if you look at the local diets, it is so deficient of omega fatty acids. 
You know, it's basically GMO pup, white sugar, overcooked veggies, and maybe a little bit of poor quality meat. No raw seeds, no nuts, no raw oils, very little fish. So we're seeing a massive amount of omega deficiency, and immune systems cannot run without essential fatty acids. They are essential because we need them, and we cannot make them in our own bodies. So getting omega fatty acids like hemp seeds into the brains of kids. So this is also about saving the kids. Yeah. The face of cannabis is changing from we've got to keep it away from kids to hold on, this can actually save a lot of kids. So hemp and brain health, obviously, alternative to fish oil. Your know, fish is so full of mercury these days, and our fish is running out. Here we have a sustainable crop that can be grown in four months and harvest the optimum ratio of omega fatty acids. What greater gift is there than that? Um, American Heart Association has given its blessing, and then obviously tie that in with the protein. You get a, a very complete food. So our growing season in Canada, which is the world's biggest grower of hemp seeds for food, they've got four months when they don't have ice on their land to grow. We can grow pretty much all year round, but definitely at least two seasons. So we have, we'll be getting much better yields than a lot of the Canadian or, or the European crops. Minimal input, so you don't have to buy your bags of poison and fertilizer and that to make it grow. Really available for small scale emerging farmers and then obviously your protein, your omega fatty acids will take some pressure off our ailing health system. If people aren't getting as sick, we won't have so many people queuing up for these hospitals and maybe we would be able to look after those who do end up there better. Um, and the hemp seeds have a high market value. At the moment, a wholesale bottle of oil is around 200 rand a liter. Obviously, that will come, come down when we're growing hundreds of thousands of hectares in this country, and I hope it comes down because it shouldn't be any higher than most other oils. We'd like to move it out of the niche and into a mainstream staple oil. So this is the project that really, for me, solidified of what, what the future is. And so we've been, as I said, working with kind of people who earn a lot of money and uh, are pretty healthy anyway. And then we were approached to help build a soup kitchen in Kailich out of Hempcrete. And it was a crowdfunded campaign, and I'm sure there are some people who put some money towards it here, so thank you very much. And that's in the, the bottom right there is the Hempcrete Soup Kitchen for a lady, Mama Mickey, who feeds 250 people a day off her government pension. And how it started with her was she came home one day, and there was a guy in the street on his hands and knees, basically. She said, what's wrong? He said, Mama, I've come from the clinic. They've given me these pills. They said I must eat with them. I can't take them without. Please, can I get some food? So she made him some food. He came back the next day because she lives down the road from the clinic. Please, Mama, can I get some more food? She made him some food. He bought some friends. Now she's feeding 250 people off donations. And she is the most amazing open-hearted woman. She just wants to feed more and more people. So we built her this hempcrete soup kitchen to get her out of this fibercrete kind of garage that she was in, that she was feeding people. And she's actually because it's such a comfortable space in the Hempcrete soup kitchen, it's breathable, it's completely different to the RDP house, which is cement tinder blocks that are a sauna in the summer and a fridge in the winter. It's insulated, it's healthy, it's a natural environment. She's actually using it to run workshops in there now. So she's teaching people about nutrition. If they want to come and get food, they have to learn about nutrition and HIV awareness and all of this. So that's a nice, comfortable space for learning. And then during that process, I said, Vicky, here's 10 liters of this oil. Put it in the soup of the people who are most at risk, that you, you, you know, the people with HIV and TB, and tell me what happens. You know, suspecting that we'd get some response. She phones me back a week later and she goes, what was the medicine you put in that oil? I'm like, medicine? It's oil. It's nutrition. And she said, well, I've had one guy who had been bedridden for a year walk to her for the first time. He had a TB, such bad TB, that she had to deliver the soup to him. He walked for the first time after a week on the oil. Another uh, girl's... Yeah. Another girl's eczema was so bad that she had to drop out of university because she was scratching the whole time. Her arms were covered with scaly eczema. People were looking at her. She actually couldn't face going to university anymore. Her eczema healed. Um, another kid's seizures slowed down. They didn't stop completely, but they slowed down. And this isn't on medicinal cannabis. This is on hemp oil. And I just looked at it, and I, that's when I started studying the local diet and realizing, hold on, this is so omega-deficient, so omega-deficient, that just putting in a little bit of super hemp food 
is changing the lives of people by helping the immune system get back to balance. And that, for me, is where the future in South Africa is. You know, it's not the niche that we're currently in of eco-greeny people who ha you know, have a nice, sustainable way of life. It is the people who don't have decent houses, who are currently living in shacks or you know, living in these terrible RDP houses that fall apart after three or four years, and people who aren't eating good food and can really benefit from this. So hemp seed oil and body care products. Mickey as well started putting hemp seed oil in with the Vaseline and rubbing it on to the AIDS lesions, onto open wounds, and seeing results that the skin problems were sorting out. So she changed her name from Mickey's Soup Kitchen to Mickey's Soup Kitchen and Spa, because people were lining up now to come and get massaged with the miracle oil that they called it. So the reason it works so well in the, on our skin is the same. It's super lubricant. It's mimics our skin's oil, goes right through the derma, and is a great base for a lot of cosmetics. So that's why you see the Body Shop uses it in a whole range. Um, there's plenty of cosmetic uh, ranges out there that use hemp seed oil. And now people are starting to put CBD in there as well as a way of getting cannabidiol into your body through the skin. The benefits of hemp fiber textiles. Now, what does this have to do with health or clinical? Our bodies are built to breathe. You know, they need to breathe. And if you look at where, an, uh, where our body odor comes from, it's where it can't breathe. Under our arms, basically in our shoes, maybe in the crotch area. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you get it. Anaerobic bacteria breathes where there's no oxygen. Hemp is a hollow fiber. So in the actual fiber is oxygen. So if you're wearing it under your arms or in your socks, the socks are our best sellers because people who struggled with stinky feet their whole lives, well, usually it's the wives or the husbands who come and buy the socks. <laughs> See, hold on, it's actually not me that was stinky. It was the bacteria that was breeding there because I'm wearing polycotton or polyester socks all day and I'm not allowing a flow of oxygen. So it's got this breathability, which brings in also an antibacterial property, and, and there's more to that than just the breathability. Um, there's thermoregulation. It breathes, so it's cool in the summer and it's uh, warm in the winter. It's durable, so again, for the health of our planet, that we're not making clothing that is throw away. You know, we can keep our, uh, unfortunately for us as a business, it's a bad thing, because I still get people coming to me going, I bought a hemp t-shirt from you 10 years ago and I've still got it and I still wear it and it's great. And, you know, Please, can you come back and buy another one sometime? <laughs> it's better for the planet that we're, not, we're making things that last. Um, it's absorption of volatile organic compounds. If you use it in your home for um, upholstery, if you've got off-gassing from uh, formaldehyde from the glues that they use in most furniture, it gets absorbed by this hollow fiber and it will stay in the fabric instead of going into the air and you breathing in it, it in and causing all sorts of problems. And then obviously grown organic, so no pesticide residue in your clothing. You don't realize that a conventional cotton uses 25% of the world's pesticides that is sprayed onto the cotton and often stays on the cotton because cotton, that fiber is, is very visible. It goes straight into yarn and you absorb that through your skin when you're wearing conventional cotton clothing. So what I'm speaking here about here is a much more holistic way at of looking at health, not just at healing. We need to look at health as a way of preventing getting sick. You know, like it's, it's a much better plan to try and avoid having to take the medicine in the first place, in my mind. Creating healthy homes. So the byproduct of the fiber is a herd material, a stalk, that you mix with lime and you make a natural building material called hempcrete. Now hempcrete breeds. It doesn't go into inert, cold, dead stone like concrete. It's the lime is, uh, stays alive, so your walls of your house, much like the clothing that you wear would breathe, they breathe. They absorb humidity, they release humidity, and they filter every time they're doing that as well. So you're taking a lot of uh, toxins out of the air and then storing it into the walls. So the hemp walls get harder and harder over time because you've got calcium in the lime and carbon in the hemp, and they bond together to form calcium carbonate. So a lot of our current building materials are incredibly toxic. In the, in the production of concrete, of cement, you can make dioxins. And dioxins the size of a pea will be enough to kill everyone in this room with cancer. So really not a good idea to carry on making concrete and then surrounding us with this cold dead stone that costs us a fortune to heat and co cool, 
when we have natural alternatives. So the humidity regulation as well. Those walls are, can absorb moisture, so when your house is humid, it goes into the walls, and then when it's dry, it comes out. So you have a much more comfortable environment to live in, and it's low, to low toxicity as well. So in, in the bottom left there, you'll see my lounge, hemp carpets, hemp couches, hemp curtains, hemp cushions, hemp lampshades, hemp creet in the walls, hemp insulation in the roof and the floor, and that's not a hemp cat. And yeah. I've just been in this house now for six years, and I couldn't ever imagine living in anything else. And one of the first um, uh, architects that we engaged said, there's something that you can't measure through R and U values. There's something about the energy of living in a breathable house or a natural house, and that will affect everything, your sleep patterns, your um, the, the different uh, what's it, uh, electro frequencies that all of us are are under get absorbed by a lot of these fibers around you. So much more healthy way of living. Now CBD as a daily supplement. We've heard of its use in medicine um, as you know, for chronic and, and acute diseases, but as a daily supplement as well. We have this endocannabinoid system and there is a syndrome called chronic endocannabinoid deficiency. As we get older, especially our body doesn't produce as many endocannabinoids and also, a lot of diseases can stop our body producing endocannabinoids. So taking a supplement which will allow some exocannabinoids or phytocannabinoids to help our endocannabinoid system be in homeostasis. So again, that balance. A lot of people go, you know, like they, they focus on trying to boost the immune system. And it's not. We shouldn't boost it. We just want it to be balanced. We've seen the dangers now of boosting it too much. We've got all these um, autoimmune diseases. The immune system can actually be too active. So our aim is to really find homeostasis, to find balance in the, the substances that we put in our bodies. It can help promote healthy sleeping patterns, ease nervous system uh, conditions, can reduce if you've got low levels of pain. And I'm talking about low-dose CBD, not therapeutic doses, just low-dose on a daily basis. And it's non-psychoactive, non-toxic, and non-addictive. Yet, we have our MCC trying to register it first as a Schedule 6, which puts it with uh, opiates, and now as a Schedule 4, which will still mean you'll have to go to your doctor, have to get a prescription for s something that is non-psychoactive, non-toxic, and non-addictive. So I don't believe that's the right way to go. I believe this should be available to everyone over the counter at any time. Thanks. Juicing raw cannabis. So there's Dr. William Courtney who pioneered this. Basically, um, there is no psychoactivity when you juice cannabis. So you can increase your intake of cannabinoids by up to 60 times. Because in the raw form, THC is THC acid. It is not psychoactive. It's only through heating and um, through curing over time that the, the plant will convert from THC acid to THC. CBD acid as well will be present in the juice and your terpenes and your nutrients, and it's a very alkalizing way of getting the plant in. So this is becoming a very popular way for people who don't want to get high to get their cannabinoids. And there are some people who don't like getting high. We've got to accept that. There are a lot of people who can't get high maybe for their job or you know, if they're going to work at a place that does drug testing. What And juicing can really uh, help people in that way. Most psychoactive effects, you can make it very tasty, combine with any other juice, and avoid smoking. We all know smoking is not the best way to, to ingest things. It's a very effective way, but it causes other harms to our lungs and better dosing. So just to summarize, we've got these environmental benefits. Your one plant, multitude of uses, doesn't require these poisons to grow, conditions the soil that can be used as a phytoremediation plant to take unhealthy soil and return it to natural organic soil with much fewer seasons than the conventional ways of trying to do that. It absorbs carbon when it grows. It grows so fast that it's taking carbon out of the atmosphere, and we all know the benefits of that in mitigating climate change, and uses much less water than conventional crops, and there's zero waste plants. So that is a photo from our trial that we did for three years under this research to do not uh, permit to do research on a narcotic drug where we had to have two meters high fencing. We were limited to the European varieties. We couldn't use local varieties. And we were tasked with trying to prove commercial viability under a very strenuous situation where you only got two hectares. All our products were taken away. We were never given them back. And 
were asked, well, how did you not prove commercial viability under that? I said, well, this doesn't take a dummy or anyone who understands farming to understand why not. Our, our viewpoint on that it was never, dis never meant to succeed. We were given a task to do that we couldn't actually achieve in order just to delay us again. Perpetual imminence. Benefits to humans, that's me standing in the field that's probably about 10 weeks old. Um, it's natural, biodegradable, digestible. This word digestible is crucial to us and we're seeing it in the bigger picture of what our earth is showing us now. What is happening with all the plastics that we are putting into the earth? Clogging up our waterways, clogging up our bodies, clogging up the ocean. We are putting products into the earth that it doesn't know how to digest. So what it does, swirls it around somewhere, dumps it on a beach or it clogs up a river or the estuaries. Same thing's happening in our bodies. We're putting synthetics or single molecule synthetics that our body doesn't know how to digest, doesn't recognize as a plant, doesn't recognize as food, swirls it around. Maybe we'll dump it in the kidney or the liver or the lymphs. It's going to cause the same issues as plastic. You know, we just have to realize what we are doing without, we are doing within. And we have to find things that our body recognizes, knows how to break down, knows how to digest. That is where real medicine and real healing will come from. Breathable antibacterial tech textiles, natural homes, medicines, renewable energy, earth and body friendly cosmetics, and again, multitude of uses from one plant. 50,000 estimated uses for, uh, for the plant, as in, I don't have to list them all. <laughs> I don't have enough time. But this picture, I just wanted to speak to you a little bit about this. What do you see when you look at this picture is, firstly, obviously you can see food. That's hemp seeds. That's your protein and your oils if you had to take that and eat it. If you put it in the ground, I truly see fields of green for all. I see houses. I see sustainable clothing. I see eco-fuels. I see more food. I see medicine, healing, jobs, community, compassion. Wars have been fought over these seeds, but its biggest use is in the promotion of peace. What I see most clearly here is hope for the return to a natural, green, sustainable planet for all of us. And right now, that is the most valuable resource that we have. So if you look at that picture and believe those hands belong in handcuffs, then I'm sorry, you are the criminal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, Tony's an inspiration to all of us because, you know, if we don't grow this stuff, then we can't use it either way. Uh, but he didn't tell you a couple of things. Firstly, that um, I don't think he wants people to know because Tony is a big wave surfer. So for kicks, he goes out of the Cape Coast and surfs 12-meter waves. Uh, he doesn't like people to know it, especially the government, because it's dangerous and they might ban it. It's a lot more dangerous than, um, than hemp, actually. The other thing he didn't explain, he didn't talk about his own BMW, because being in the industry, his BMW panels have got, they, they're actually detachable, and they've got a high THC content. So if you want a happy lift, ask Tony. And um, anyway, how are we doing there? 